everyone! In this video, we'll be analysing Maura Dooley's poem, Letters from Yorkshire. Maura Dooley was born in 1957 in Truro, England. She's a poet and creative writing professor, and at the time of this video, she teaches at Goldsmiths, University of London. Dooley began her career as an arts administrator at the Arvin Foundation, which is a British NGO that offers residential writing retreats for established and aspiring authors. She was later literature officer at London's Southbank Centre, and in addition to her contributions to poetry, is also actively involved in film and theatre. Since the publication of her first poetry volume in 1986, titled Ivy Leaves and Arrows, Dooley has enjoyed widespread acclaim within the United Kingdom, having won the Eric Gregory Award for Poets Under the Age of 30 in 1987, and having been shortlisted twice for both the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Forward Prize for Best Single Poem. I will now read the poem aloud once, but as usual, if you want to do that yourself, which I recommend, you can click pause and return to the video once you're done. In February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwings return and came indoors to write to me. His knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. It's not romance, simply how things are. You out there, in the cold, seeing the seasons turning. Me with my heart full of headlines feeding words onto a blank screen. Is your life more real because you dig and sow? You wouldn't say so. Breaking ice on a water butt. Clearing a path through snow. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope. So that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. Letters from Yorkshire is a hopeful poem. It expresses a kind of humanistic faith in mutual connection and suggests that physical distance does not have to imply emotional detachment. Somewhat ironically, the two are even shown to strengthen each other in the poem. In letters, it's implied that the speaker and her correspondent are pen pals, and perhaps pen pals with more than a tinge of affection for each other. And yet, the speaker insists that their relationship is not romance, simply how things are. Now, this is a classic example of what we call apophysis, which is the technique of bringing up a topic only to deny it. So the speaker seems to be saying that they share a platonic relationship, but it's definitely one that's nourished by the magic of words and fortified by this charm of distance. Notice that there's also an overarching motif of nourishment in the poem, which shows up in the references to planting potatoes, feeding words onto a blank screen, and pouring air and light into an envelope. Set against a wintry context, which we can tell from the reference to February and the cold, this imagery of growth sharpens the contrast between activity and stasis, which suggests that a certain energy and passion is what keeps the relationship going, despite the distance. Now, one of the ways in which Dooley bridges the realms of connection and distance in this poem is through the use of cross stanza enjambment, which we can see in the turns from stanza 1 to 2, stanza 2 to 3, and stanza 4 to 5. With each swivel into a new tercet, these lines enact through the crossing over of a formal gap 
the possibility of connection through words. While the white buffer between the stances could be a visual reminder of that path through snow that Dooley alludes to in line 11. We can also consider the speaker and her correspondence out of writing letters to each other as the symbolic clearing of the snowy path, which the stanza leaps enact. The run-on between the personified phrase knuckle singing and as they reddened hints at the man's need to pause, breathe and recompose before he can switch mode from laborious work to letter writing. While the gap between seasons at the end of stanza 2 and turning at the start of stanza 3 is a wonderful literalization of that pivot from winter to spring. And finally, we have the travelling over from word of that other world at the end of stanza 4 to pouring air and light into an envelope, which crystallises that idea of intimate connection through distant communication. It's a really elegant way of synergising words and spaces, and of showing that meaning doesn't always have to come from what's explicitly stated or immediately visible. Another observation to note is the cluster of internal rhymes in the latter half of the poem. Strictly speaking, this begins in line 6 with the word cold, which isn't echoed until the arrival of so at the end of line 9. Is your life more real because you dig and so? Thereafter, the O sound cascades into the following lines. You wouldn't say so clearing a path through snow, pouring air and light into an envelope so that at night, and the final line, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. So what are we to make of this gradual increase in internal rhyme? Well, one possible reading is to see this as a reflection of the speaker and the man's growing connection, which is made stronger with each letter or message they send one another. It's interesting to consider that what he sows isn't just the seeds in his garden, but the words that carry the air and light to the speaker, who is here cremamorphosized into a plant which requires photosynthesis to blossom and survive. Now, cremamorphism, by the way, is the opposite of personification and refers to attributing inanimate qualities to humans. So here we see a plant that's being um, compared to the speaker. Now, this also seems to imply that the speaker is in a passive stationary position. After all, plants can't move. As that, her survival is at least in part reliant on his provision of nourishing words. So is she then suggesting that he has the upper hand in their relationship? Despite the logistical challenges posed by Snow, Their verbal exchanges bring their souls closer together towards the end of the poem, as it ends with the scene of both characters moving in perfect synchrony, with the two watching the same news and tapping out messages to one another. So romance or no romance, the speaker suggests that her correspondent completes and complements her existence and is that important someone who sends me word of that other world. And speaking of this line, sends me word of the other world, we notice that there is a half rhyme of word and world. And they're quite striking for their lexical similarity as well. And at the risk of seeming like we're stretching it a bit far, it's perhaps worth considering that the word word is one L letter away from the word world, which is not unlike the situation of the speaker, who is always one letter, and here in the sense of correspondence letter, not the alphabet, she's always one letter away from her pen pal's world. So part of what gives this poem its energy is the prevalence of gerunds. And we know what gerunds are, so they are verbs that end with the ing suffix, and it indicates continuous action. 
So examples of gerunds in this poem include digging, planting, and singing in the first stanza, seeing in the second stanza, turning and feeding in the third, breaking and clearing in the penultimate one, and pouring and watching in the final stanza. These gerunds seem to at once suggest the revival of life as winter morphs into spring, and that ceaselessness of verbal activity and emotional engagement despite external stasis. The poem we see is led through a continuum of movement as the man's digging of gardens and planting of potatoes slowly transition to the clearing of paths and the pouring of words into letters. So the resulting message that we get is this association of love with labour, whether that love be a platonic or romantic sort, and whether that labour be manual or scribal in nature. So it's equally possible then to see this poem as a celebration of writing as a continual collaborative process, and a process which relies on energies and feelings akin to those of two people in love. As we know, a life and love conducted through words is no less real than one that's grounded in physical proximity and can be as strong a testament to passion as other forms of human work and relationship. That's it, guys. If you find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for other GCSE and A-level English literature videos. Make sure you check out the blog post in the description box and don't forget to leave me a comment so that you let me know what you're studying and what else you want to see from this channel in the future. See you soon!